years of preparation, years of anticipation. Football at last for USF. Bulls fans remember how smoothly that first game went, but not everything was how it appeared, starting with the team's bus ride to Tampa Stadium. Both buses went there, but one bus went the wrong way. The bus I was on went to the locker room. The other bus went down because I believe there was construction or things going on and let them out. And, and, and I remember getting out and trying to run and flag the other bus down because they let them out like uh, a block away. They got caught and they didn't, weren't going to back up. So they just let them out and they had to walk all the way back. And I sat there and thought right away, I cannot believe that we couldn't even get the buses to the right place. One went one place and one went way up. I remember just fences and being in the wrong area and just being going, I cannot believe it's starting like this. And then there was the kicking team. The Bulls didn't have one. We, we kind of had a little problem there with, uh, with, uh, with uh, the kickoff tee. Uh, while we're all set, we looked around and said, who's got the tee? And there was no tee. <laughs> The team arrived safely, and soon a police officer made the Bulls' first open field run to a sporting goods store. Moments later, by police escort, a kicking tee was delivered to Tampa Stadium. The crowd never knew. It, you know, it's kind of funny when you look back on that now and everything, and uh, as much work as, as, uh, as all of us had <laughs> put into this, a small detail like that gets overlooked. And... Uh, but that's a part of it, and uh, a part of the history, and it's kind of one of those little funny parts that uh, you can kind of cling on to that, that it sets right in the memory of the game itself. In the meantime, Kentucky Wesleyan won the toss and elected to kick off, buying the Bulls some more time. At 7.06 p.m. on Saturday, September 6, 1997, using his own team's tee, a Bulls football trivia question in the making. Kentucky Wesleyan kicker Adam Kilgore became the first player to touch the ball in a USF football game. Coming down to Charles Jackson. He takes it at the two. Jackson breaks the seam. He's at the 30 and pulled down. The fact that the Bulls had to race a tee to the game became an entertaining remembrance rather than a problem. Outside of that, I think that was the only glitch it was that evening. With Charlie Jackson's return, USF football had officially begun. But in truth, this beginning was really the end of a long journey to bring football to USF. A journey filled with stops and starts, many more challenging than a missing kicking tee or a confused bus driver. College football in Tampa Bay ended in the 1970s when the popular Tampa Spartans program folded after more than 40 years of play. After early efforts at starting USF football failed, the first attempt to gain serious momentum began with a feasibility study in the early 1990s under the leadership of then USF president, Dr. Frank Borkowski. It was not an easy road. This was not warmly endorsed, especially by the Board of Regents, because the Board of Regents was comprised principally of Gators and Seminoles. And so, they just didn't want another football team here in this large recruitment area. But thanks to growing public interest, momentum did increase, and by 1993, USF was able to announce a critical new hire. Tampa Bay Buccaneer icon and community leader Leroy Selman was brought on board to fundraise and be the first face of USF football. Actually, what occurred uh, probably two years out in front of my hiring uh, Dr. Borkowski uh, invited me to come out and be a part of the homecoming parade here on campus. And the students, of course, has always been uh, excited and interested in starting a, a football program. So my role in the parade was to uh, just ride in the back of a pickup and have some little small footballs and just kind of throw them out to the crowd as we travel the route. And uh, so in the, in the uh, staging area, I was standing by uh, Dr. Borkowski and uh, said, hey, when, if, if things get serious about beginning football, I said, I'd be interested in, you know, helping out and doing whatever I can. There's nothing wrong with Leroy Selman. Leroy Selman had a professional career of how many years? I know I was sponsored for the Hall of Fame. He never got a personal foul. Never. Can you imagine that? He said, I once almost did, but I let him go. <laughs> Right, he's, he's absolutely perfect, clean as a whistle, family guy, 
Loves this town. I don't think he ever wanted to go anywhere after he came here to start with. Two years after that homecoming parade, the program was starting to take shape. The offer to Selman came in a phone call from athletic director Paul Griffin. It was gaining momentum and uh, asked uh, if I would have an interest in coming aboard and be a part of that effort. And uh, for me, it was a no-brainer. It quickly became clear that if USF was to start football, they would need community backing for the dream to become a reality. Selman first turned to community leader and longtime USF friend Frank Morsani to help lead an effort to raise the funds needed to secure program approval. Many answered the call. Among those who responded was the late Ed Rood, whose commitment was both generous and critically early in the process. I reflect back on those days and you think about Ed Rood, who uh, I thought really uh, established a tone that it was serious about uh, beginning college football here at USF and you know, he made a million dollar commitment. As far as I'm concerned, he was the foundation for the program because he said, I will put post one million dollars when the program is assured. And he did. Money was coming together. People were starting to believe. But USF football still faced a critical hurdle, approval by the Florida Board of Regents. First downs, tackles, and kickoffs were still a long way in the future and by no means a sure thing. After numerous meetings, the grilling of USF officials continued. Constantly being asked questions about the development of the program, the support of the program, how were we going to enter, how we're going to schedule, it was, you know, where we're going to play at. I mean, just all kinds of questions. And, uh, it, but here comes. Or Orlando, where you know you're going to get the thumbs up, but the final thumbs up or thumbs down on it, and so you you go in there with great optimism. You know, went there with great optimism, but yet a a little bit of caution that is someone going to throw something into this that's now going to at the eleventh hour say it's not going to work. And uh, but fortunately, uh, we did get the approval, and um, that was the initial startup of. Um, USF football, and, uh, uh, and it's, hey, it's just been great ever since. In the end, the financial foundation that had been built and the public enthusiasm that had been demonstrated led to a positive vote. On September 15, 1995, on the campus of the University of Central Florida in Orlando, the Board of Regents said yes, and USF football was officially born. The research was, was accurate. Uh, the talent pool here, the support here, a major university, a great state of Florida. Um, all the components was in place. We just had to convince a few people that, uh, that we knew what we were doing. <laughs> Former Tampa Tribune sports editor Tom McEwen was asked by USF President Betty Castor to speak to the Board of Regents on that critical day in USF history. His comments were short and to the point. She asked Leroy and me to say a word. Well, of course, all I said was we should have started 40 years ago. Late or not, the deal was finally done. USF was going to play football. Now it was time to find a coach. The University of South Florida has established itself as the university of first choice. And today we're here to introduce to you the first coach in USF football history. The next link in Paul Griffin's plan was set as USF ultimately chose a homegrown product. A graduate of Dixie Hollins High School, a star baseball and football player at Missouri, and the current defensive coordinator at Kansas State. And let me ask you to give a great South Florida welcome to Jim Levitt. As Levitt stood at the podium on that day in December 1995, he had no players, no coaches, no offices, no helmets, and no footballs. But he did have the now familiar Jim Levitt enthusiasm. Uh, you know, I, I have high expectations and I'm very idealistic. Uh, I really believe that there's going to be some tremendous players who are going to want to be a part of something that's, uh, that's new, very exciting, uh, that's building with, uh, uh, with a future that, I, that I, uh, I believe will be very bright. Uh, the challenge, I thought, was, uh, was uh, in some way overwhelming, but exciting. Challenging but doable. Levitt, Athletic Director Paul Griffin, and University President Betty Castor soon had their timetable. Preparations would continue in the remainder of 1995, a team would be formed and would practice in 1996, and the games would begin in 1997. At the absolute beginning, even the simplest of tasks were filled with a multitude of questions. How are they going to shower? 
Where are they going to shower? Finding towels. How about washing clothes? Finding clothes. Who do, who's going to buy the clothes? What clothes are they going to buy? Who has that authority? Who is going to video practice? Where are we going to go to find a camera? I could go on and on right now because none of this we had. What we did had, we, we had great people. We had a great community. Gradually, those and hundreds of other questions were answered and practice began. Those early sessions didn't look much like the practices of today. Of this first group of bulls, only 14 would make it through the practice year and all four years of game competition. The team went through conditioning drills with no games in their immediate future, and the work was intense. But under the summer sun, the days slowly melted away until the time finally arrived for the Bulls to make their first public appearance. On September 6, 1996, one year to the day before the inaugural game, a group of players with less than a dozen practices behind them took the stage. Over 5,000 fans anxious for a glimpse of USF football crowded into the Bulls soccer stadium to watch the first public scrimmage. Nine practices with a bunch of guys that have never been in college football, for the most part, we had a few transfers. I, are we gonna be able to be organized to run a play, to run a defense? Forget the kicking game, we hadn't even gotten there. And when 5,000 showed up, I was astounded. I really was. I was, I was more concerned about if officials were gonna show up, if the field was lined correctly, if the lights were gonna come on, if we were going to come out and even look like a team, if the uniforms were going to be on correctly, uh, if they even knew how to warm up, uh, if they knew where to go on the field to warm up, those were more my concerns than anything else. It wasn't Bulls football as we know it now. Coaches roamed the field between plays and many of the players in this scrimmage would never play it down in a real game. But the crowd was entranced and the bond between the team and its fans was forged that night. The dreams of the players and coaches were already in place, including those of a young defensive back named Anthony Henry, who would be an NFL star less than five years after he walked off the soccer field that night. Uh, people were chanting, you know, go Bulls and South Florida and whole deal. And, you know, it was, uh, it was pretty powerful. It was a powerful moment. The team was on its way, but much of the program's infrastructure was still to come. As the day of the first game drew near, the coaches still worked out of trailers and facilities were primitive, leaving the staff and players to do the best they could with what they had. Never really ever talked about what we didn't have. We always talked about what we did have. Meanwhile, the fans were getting ready. Matt and Melissa Guerin bought their first Bulls season tickets when they were still USF students. We bought season tickets my senior year because we wanted to lock in really a uh, spot because we knew uh, eventually it was going to be the hot ticket in town and we wanted to make sure we held, had our spot from the beginning where we wanted to sit. In September 1997, the months and years of preparation finally led to what players, coaches, administrators and especially fans had waited so long for, a football game. It had been a long wait. Getting ready on game day wasn't a problem. All day it was just, just constant phone calls because uh, there was going to be our first USF tailgate. We've done Bucks before, and we were out at the Bucks game, so we're like, what are we going to do for USF? And we, you know, we had to go around, think of all the green and gold stuff we could get. You know, at the time, it wasn't really accessible everywhere to go get green and gold themed items and this and that. So uh, we spent all day hunting down stuff, packing the coolers, coordinating with everybody, because we want to make sure everybody got in at the same time, so we all parked next to each other. And uh, we had a pretty big tailgate party, I remember that day, about like 25 of us out there. I do remember shivers. I remember seeing the power of the of the crowd. I can remember that very very clear. I can remember standing by Leroy Selman. I remember that very clear. And him and I standing in the middle of the field talking. But I do remember that the crowd. It was a huge crowd. And I and it was almost like I was floating on a cloud. Yeah, I didn't know how many people were gonna have to the game and when we had you know, what we have a little over like 49 and change, it was, uh, you, walk, you got in there and when they had the little fireworks when they ran out, it was pretty cool, it gave you goosebumps. The Bulls chose an NAIA school, Kentucky Wesleyan, as their first opponent. In front of 49,212 fans, after months of practice with no games, the inaugural team players held nothing back. 
By the time it was over, the Bulls had scored a mind-boggling 80-3 victory. I never expected this. I honestly, honestly, I never expected us. I thought we'd win. I never said that, but I thought we'd win. But I didn't know we'd win like that. Everything was just flowing so naturally, like the easiest thing in the world. But let me tell you something. It was a lot of work. I'm telling you, a lot of work. By 1998, the Bulls had a new home. They christened Raymond James Stadium with a 45-6 win over the Citadel, establishing what would become a habit, defeating a team that had beaten them a year earlier. With a new stadium and large crowds, the Bulls program was coming of age at home. On the road, however, there were still some humble times, including playing at Cumberland and Charleston Southern in front of less than 1,000 fans. You almost feel like uh, Lewis and Clark trailing across the United States, blazing a trail. We were just trying to find anybody with play. So we ended up at places that, and I had no idea. I had no idea about the level of competition. You get a little bit of film, but you don't get much, and it's not very good and you don't know much about the people. So there, there was some frustration at some places, but our guys, we just played hard. We focused on us and trying to do the best we could, and uh, that enabled us really to keep our head above water. By 1999, road trips were changing too. USF opened on the road at San Diego State, and the game was a landmark one for two reasons, the first 1A opponent and the Bulls' debut of quarterback Markwell Blackwell. I saw excitement, I saw tremendous talent, I saw a quarterback that could, that could take us to the promised land. He was a guy that had everything that I was looking for in a quarterback. Quick release, great courage, confidence, throw the ball, lead a team, you know. Didn't make a lot of errors, didn't lose a game for us, and, and, he, and, he, and he's competitive. By the 2000 season, the Bulls began scheduling more and more 1A opponents. They did play and beat the best team in 1AA that year, knocking off number one ranked Troy State 20 to 10. It was later that year, in a cold wind at Storrs, Connecticut, that the Bulls claimed their first Division 1A victim, defeating future conference foe UConn. In that season, Markwell Blackwell came of age, setting numerous USF passing records, including 360 yards through the air in this game against Western Kentucky on November 4, 2000. Two weeks later, in a season-ending blowout of Austin P, possibly the most remarkable play to date in USF history occurred as Bill Gramatica lined up for a 63-yard field goal. His brother held the college record at 65 yards, would the Bulls take a penalty to make the kick a record breaker? I was wondering if, I, at the time, I was thinking, is Levitt going to take the delay of game? Well, you know, I, I thought about it because I really wanted him to have a shot at it, but I, when I started looking from 63 and saw how far it was, I thought, how can anybody kick it this far? Nobody was saying a word. And you could hear the thud when his foot hit the ball, the explosion. He couldn't have hit it any better. And it kept rising and rising and rising. And it even was rising through the goalpost. He cleared it by 15 yards. It was an amazing kick that I'll promise you could have gone for almost 80 years from now. But it will laugh. 80. You watch the film, you see the kick. And then debate it with me. The accomplishments of that 2000 team did not go unnoticed. In the April 2001 NFL draft, the nation got a quick education on USF football as early in the fourth round, three consecutive Bulls were drafted. Anthony Henry, Bill Gramatica, and Kenyatta Jones would all make their NFL teams and Jones would win a Super Bowl ring. For the man who coached all three, it was a special moment. I rose up and the arms went up, and I ran around the couch and in my kitchen. I can't tell you how many times. And I was overwhelmed, overjoyed, 
The media started calling. I started doing interviews at the stadiums, anywhere they could find me on the street. Because I was driving, I couldn't sit still. That was a proud moment. It really was. The Bulls took the next step forward in a fashion that was just as dramatic as having three players in a row taken in the draft. September 8, 2001, the second ever Pittsburgh Panther game at the new Heinz Field, and the Bulls ruined the Panthers' day. Still a 1A independent, the Bulls bolted to an early lead and stunned the Big East Panthers 35 to 26 for their biggest win to date. I remember she was calling me because I was upstairs. She's like, you need to get down here and see what's happening. Oh, I was screaming. I was jumping up and down in the living room, and I'm just like, go, go, go. I was exhausted. At the end of the game, I remember just looking across the field. A couple of guys came up. I remember DeAndre Rubin came up and said, we did it. We did it. And I remember being tired, and I remember walking across the field to shake hands. But I remember being very content, accomplished, reaching a goal, reaching a moment that I knew was very powerful. Already in Conference USA for all other sports, USF felt confident the football program would soon be accepted into the league. But when the CUSA offer did come, the Bulls were shocked to find out they would have to wait until 2003. One of the most difficult times of my tenure. So I remember sitting back and just kind of looking down and pausing and thinking and uh, being very, I was down. I was really, really down. And that took a few days. Usually things don't hit me too much. and I usually rise up. That one took a few days. I didn't know how to tell the players. I didn't know how to tell the guys we recruited, their families. Uh, I mean, we really went after it. Uh, that was very, very difficult. That was a tough time. By 2002, the duo of Markwell Blackwell and DeAndrew Rubin had become the most electric offensive weapon the Bulls had ever had. On September 7, 2002, they added another USF record to their collection. At 95 yards, this was the longest Bulls play from scrimmage in their first 100 games. Three weeks later, another breakthrough. The Bulls played on national TV for the first time. USF faced Oklahoma, and Leroy Selman went home. It was exciting, too, humbling again for how our our program here, the people here had the t-shirts all made up and the Selman shirts and all of that. And I thought that was very nice of them to do that. And, and likewise, at, uh, uh, the University of Oklahoma uh, really opened their arms to welcome our team, but also to welcome them back. And because uh, I don't get back there too often to watch games and uh, for them to go out of the way like they did, that was very humbling as well. So that was a great, great evening. The 2002 season wasn't the Bulls' Conference USA debut they had hoped for, but the conference had helped USF fill out their schedule by arranging four games against CUSA teams. Thinking they would be in the league by now, Jim Levitt had built his 2002 USF team to play for a CUSA championship. Even though they couldn't win that league title, these four games at least would show if they had built correctly. You develop a plan when you build a program. And the thing that I felt best about the plan was that it, it would have worked. You know, though for the seniors, that was one of the best teams. We were building for that, and uh, that team should have gone to a bowl. Uh, it was bowl eligible. Second year in 1A football, went eight and three, and were bowl eligible the year before. Uh, that everything was going according to plan, except the big one, not letting us in the conference USA. With that, the Bulls proceeded to blast through their CUSA opponents. The first to fall was Southern Miss when a late field goal went wide. The Golden Eagles were a perennial CUSA title contender, and the statement was huge. Blackwell with time. Still looking for help. Going deep. Scott Rubin. Rubin takes it in for the touchdown. And it didn't end there. East Carolina had scheduled the Bulls for their homecoming. But as both USF's offense and defense scored, the Bulls left the Pirates with little to celebrate. Next was Memphis, back in Tampa. The Tigers had beaten the Bulls the prior season, but not on this day. 
The Bulls were now 3-0 against their future conference brethren. The season ended in Houston with a 32-14 win. The run through CUSA teams was over with the Bulls averaging more than 30 points a game and going 4-0 against the league that had made them wait for membership. But the Bulls' finest moment of the 2002 season might have come the week before on November 16, 2002. 25th ranked Bowling Green, the first ranked Division 1A team to come to Raymond James Stadium, was pummeled by the Bulls 29-7. In the midst of this great run on the field, a landmark moment happened off the field. On November 6, 2002, 10 days before the win over Bowling Green, the Bulls broke ground on their new athletic training facility. Donors to the facility, including Chris Sullivan, Frank and Carol Morsani, and Don and Erica Wallace, would help the building become a reality in less than two years. It was necessary. Uh, University of South Florida was, in my opinion, would have never gotten in the Big East if this building of this magnitude was not built. Because the Big East had to see a progressive attitude, had to see and administration embrace a program. The Bulls finished the 2002 season 9-2, but with no conference affiliation, postseason play was still a long shot. The Bulls' best chance at a bowl game was a provisional bid to the Hawaii Bowl. Although preparations were made, the Bulls knew their chances hinged on a late season game at East Carolina. They would get in only if East Carolina beat Cincinnati and denied the Bearcats bowl eligibility. In December 2002, many of the Bulls gathered at Leroy Selman's restaurant, camped out in front of the TV, and became East Carolina Pirate fans for a night. Cincinnati won the game, and the Bulls, with their 9-2 record and seven straight wins to close the season, stayed home. It came down to our only opportunity, but I thought there was going to be two or three others. I thought we'd have some others, and, and you know, you really have to work hard to politically battle your way in when you're an independent. Uh, in my life, I realized more and more how unfair it was and how you really needed to get into a conference. By the end of the 2002 campaign, Jim Levitt had been head coach of the Bulls for six seasons, and USF had won 44 games under his leadership. Alabama and other schools came calling. Moving quickly to keep Levitt in Tampa, USF awarded him with a contract extension in December 2002. As the 2003 season arrived, it was at last time to enter Conference USA. Historic Mikey Stadium at Army was the site of the first conference game, and the Bulls wasted no time in making an opening statement to the league as they shut out Army 28 to nothing for their first Conference USA win. Behind the scenes, however, the focus wasn't just on the CUSA opener, it was on getting into the Big East. On a bright sunny day in 2003, USF President Judy Genshaft and Athletic Director Leroy Selman led a Bulls contingent to an unpublicized closed-door meeting with a delegation of Big East officials. Their job? To get the Bulls in the Big East. It was an awesome day. It was very, very exciting. I went up with uh, Leroy Selman and uh, our Vice President for Advancement. We had practiced on the way up. We had gotten every detail we could think about in, ter in terms of the university as well as athletics. So they were learning about our ethics, they were learning about our values, and they were learning more about the university in total. They left the meeting not knowing USF status, but when the president had her first chance to speak privately to Selman on the plane ride back to Tampa, there was plenty of optimism. Well, I just kind of looked at him to see his facial reaction, and I said, what'd you think? And he said, I think we did well, and I said, Yes, you know, we were very, very thrilled. They read the signs correctly. The Bulls would find out later that the president's belief in the university and her enthusiasm about the athletic department had helped seal the deal. USF would go to the Big East. It would be still another new era for the Bulls and for the university as well. At least for a while, though, it would have to remain a closely guarded secret. We had to go home and wait and be very, very quiet, but we had a lot of planning to do when we finally got the unofficial word that we were going to be in the Big East, and it was all about planning how we were going to make this a great, great, great event. It is 
one of the most historic events for the University of South Florida, getting into the Big East. The Bulls' great success in this period was at home. By this time, a remarkable win streak had grown to one of the longest in the nation. From September 2, 2000 to October 4, 2003, 21 straight opponents fell to the Bulls in Tampa. The streak eventually would end that fall, but possibly the most memorable series of games in Bulls history is still ahead. The Bulls had played one overtime game in their history, beating New Hampshire in double overtime in 1999. Now, in a five-week period, they would play three double overtime games and win them all. First up was Louisville on October 4th in the first home conference USA game. The Bulls won 31-28 on a Santiago Gramatica field goal. On October 31st on national television, the Bulls took the field against Cincinnati. J.R. Reed had an interception, Huey Whitaker a crucial kick block, and as the sideline reacted to Leroy Selman Jr.'s game-clinching interception, the Bulls had won in double overtime again. On that particular play, I, uh, you know, I happened to be talking, I was up in the box, and I was, we had, you know, of course, uh, invited guests, and so I was actually at that time kind of visiting with them, and actually, didn't, actually did not see the play happen. And someone said, "Hey, your son, he intercepted the ball, and it's the game's over." I said, really? So it kind of shocked me. Say, well, because he's a defensive lineman, and he's usually rushing the quarterback, and uh, didn't know. I said, he must have had great hustle. I was just trying to get somewhere to, to make the tackle. I figured that he was probably going to throw a, a, a small pitch somewhere, and I was just wanting to get in on the play, and then. You know, before I knew it, the ball was up in the air, and I was like, is that up for grabs, kind of? <laughs> so I'm like, okay, well, I'll go ahead and take it. Just one week later, the Bulls made NCAA history as they won yet another double overtime game on the road at East Carolina when an ECU extra point went off the post. In a 35-day period, the Bulls had won three double overtime games. Sandwiched in between those dramatic wins was a dramatic announcement. On November 4th, 2003, the Bulls formally announced they would head to the Big East Conference. I'm pleased to announce that uh, beginning with the 2005-06 season, five new schools will be joining us. Uh, the University of Louisville, the University of Cincinnati, the University of South Florida, DePaul University, and Marquette University. University leadership and community support had helped the Bulls in, as had success on the field. We were undefeated against Big East schools. And I'll promise you, that had some leverage. The fact that we had beaten Pittsburgh, that we had beaten Connecticut twice, that we had just beaten Cincinnati, and that we had beaten Louisville. If we had lost those games, would we have still gotten in the Big East? Maybe. Maybe not. The Bulls were in. They would play one more year in Conference USA and then join the BCS family in the Big East in 2005. We like the uh, institutions that are in the Big East. Pittsburgh, Rutgers, Cincinnati, Louisville, they're all good matches for USF, both academically and athletically. After that, it was back to the field of play and one of the most dominating individual performances Bulls fans had ever seen. In the last game of the 2003 season in Memphis, J.R. Reed scored twice on a kick return and on a fumble recovery. He also had three interceptions in what would be his final game as a Bull, almost single-handedly leading USF to a 21-16 win as USF finished 7-4 overall and 5-3 in CUSA. The summer of 2004 was highlighted by the opening of the Athletic Training Center just 18 months after ground had been broken. Boasting state-of-the-art weight rooms and training facilities, a large study area, and office space for administrators, the Bulls finally had a building to call their own. It's meant a great deal to the entire athletic department and certainly, you know, to the football program. Uh, facilities are so important anymore for student athletes and the community and, and certainly for, uh, the, uh, for a program to evolve as this football program has. And uh, if you talk with uh, our football coaches, you know, they certainly will tell you that uh, this building has made a tremendous impact in recruiting. The Bulls were back on the field in the fall of 2004 for what would be their second and final season in Conference USA. One of the most memorable games of the season would feature even more USF double overtime magic. 
Facing TCU, the team that had ended their home winning streak the year before, the Bulls had plenty to think about. Told before the game they could not fly home that night because Hurricane Jean was threatening the Tampa Bay area, USF stayed focused in what would be one of the first breakout games for a junior running back wearing jersey number two. Andre Hall would score four times, and the Bulls would go to 5-0 all-time in double overtime games with a 45-44 decision sealed with a missed TCU point after touchdown attempt. Later in 2004, in gray and foreboding Legion Field in front of a small rain-soaked crowd, the Bulls beat UAB 45-20 for what would be one of their final Conference USA victories. After the 2003 trip to Newark and the 2004 press conference, the Bulls raised the banner on Big East membership on July 1, 2005. Two years earlier, the Bulls had defeated Louisville in their first home Conference USA game. Now the Cardinals would be the first home Big East opponent, and September 24, 2005 would become one of the most memorable nights in USF football's first decade. After losing to Louisville 41-9 the prior season, the Bulls scored virtually every way imaginable en route to a 45-14 victory. Just as they had proven themselves ready for CUSA two years earlier, the Bulls had now shown themselves to be ready for the Big East. Well, I was scared. Actually, the Louisville game is what scared me last year, and it ended up being the best game of the whole entire season. We went to every game last year, home and away, and by far Louisville was the best game. The game against Louisville was part of the most grueling schedule the Bulls had ever faced. Six of 11 games, including four Big East games, were on the road. But USF defeated Rutgers with some quick touchdowns by the defense. The following week, they shut out Syracuse in the Carrier Dome. Andre Hall, playing in just his 20th USF game, became the school's all-time leading rusher. The 2005 regular season record was 6-5 against a rugged schedule, good enough for USF's first bowl appearance. After a season-ending game against West Virginia, the Bulls got the official word. On behalf of Meineke and Raycom Sports, we would love to have the University of South Florida in oh, Charlotte yeah. for the Meineke Car Care Bowl. USF Athletic Director Doug Willard was in the locker room for the presentation. It certainly was well deserved for coaches who have taken this program so far in such a short time. But really the enjoyment for me was, was looking at the eyes of the players and to see in their eyes that, uh, you know what, they're going to be the first ever to, to make a bowl appearance for USF and hopefully the first of many. But uh, that was a pretty special moment. Gentlemen, start your engines. The Bulls' 100th game would be a bowl game in Charlotte, North Carolina against North Carolina State. The bowl experience was new to the Bulls and they sampled it all. The people involved with the Meineke Car Care Bowl, I thought, were tremendous. If there was a first bowl to go to other than the Sugar Bowl, that would have been the one. Along with time on the racetrack, a downtown pep rally was one of the highlights in the days before the game as thousands of Bulls fans celebrated with Andre Hall. We are South Florida! We are South Florida! Leroy Selman Jr. is one of only two players to spend six years with the program. It's been a huge metamorphosis and it's just amazing how, how high, how, how quickly this program has grown. You know, it goes back to, you know, just the, the staff who, who just had the ambition and, and had the drive and, and the coaching staff and the players, as well as this whole community that has uh, really embraced USF football. Fans Matt and Melissa Guerin are starting their second decade as season ticket holders. Top tier program I'd envision. Um, I think that's everybody's vision. I would envision that seats are going to be hard to come by to, to be in the stadium to watch us play. Which is uh, why we made the investment now. And I also see us just... Uh, I see more marquee teams on the schedule probably, and if not, I just see us, uh, you know, contending, being the top one or two teams in the Big East every year. After a successful stint as athletic director, Leroy Selman remains with the Bulls as president of the USF Foundation Partnership for Athletics. What was anticipated in the beginning has proven true so far, and that's the reason why it's had success that it's enjoyed the first 10 years. I don't believe that's going to change the next 10 years uh, as the program continue to reach milestones, more history, 
Uh, now in the Big East, uh, we have a platform and a stage that allows us the opportunity to go for the ultimate goal in college football, which is a national championship. And I won't sell this program anything short of that. The cornerstone of USF football remains head coach Jim Levin. I don't sit and reflect very much. I don't sit and think about we did this, we did this, we did this. I, I really don't. I think about how can we win the Big East Championship. I believe it's only a matter of time. But the key is the Tampa Bay community. It is that powerful. They can do as much as they want to do. You really want to make this up to be one of the juggernauts? It's got to happen now. Doug Willard has led the athletic program and USF football through the move to the Big East. This program has progressed so far in such a short time. But you know what? I think we have so much potential in front of us. I think we almost have more potential in front of us than what we've even progressed to at this point. And uh, uh, this program, I think, is headed for some great things. Nine seasons, 10 years, 100 games. From one AA independent to proud BCS member, from missing kicking tees and bad bus rides to the heights of college football, no program has done it faster or better and probably none ever will. Protection picked off by the Bulls. Intercepted. Roy Manns. One man to beat. Can't do it. Touchdown. Tampa Bay and the South Florida Bulls. 31 yards on the touchdown. Barnhart rolls right under pressure. Throws. Caught. Otis Dixon. Otis running over people inside the five. Hugo. Bernard Brown needs a block. Touchdown, South Florida. The big plays continue this time from the defense. Huey Whitaker comes up with the football working on Charlie Pepper. What a catch by Huey Whitaker. Here comes blindside pressure. Hit, fumbled. Terrence Royal picks it up and he will score. And there he is. speed not much of a contest there Al touchdown 86 yards Raphael Williams fumbles the football and the Bulls pick it up J.R. Reed he has one man to beat no flag down touchdown South Florida up the middle, busts into the secondary, Williams in the open field, he will score! Coming out of nowhere, a big time hit for the Bulls and a fumble, Thurman Edwards with the sack. Screen. This there is there. The Pass pump fake now looks long far sideline throws it is picked off Anthony Henry from the 30 McMillan with the hole excellent running by McMillan at the five Mayo Whoa. he runs right through Mayo's tackle Russell emotion the looking pass oh Second. Blackwell rolls left, picks up a great block from Jones. You see the time, one timeout left. Let's look, Bills taking their time. Let's, Barnhart looking, rolling into the flat wide open and catching it on the sidelines and breaking away down the sidelines is R.J. Anderson. He's got field goal What range. a big time play by R.J. Bulls, Umholtz, the punt for the first time. What a punt, beautiful. 
Very close to the goal line. Clip down. Wow. Oh, my God. I'll tell you what, in the NFL, you will kill to have a guy that can make that play right there. That is a spectacular play by Cliff Dell. That's a great job by Jimmy Fitz, the right guard. Another back to pass. Here comes pressure. Sean Hay from the blind side got him. If he hits it, we're off to overtime. If not, the Bulls have their biggest victory yet. And the kick is... Oh, God! And the South Florida Bulls wow. beat Southern Mississippi! A brutal hit from Jason Butler. Here's the line green. How do you get through? That's the end zone. Touchdown. <laughs> Southern miss from the 42 of the Bulls. They will run a huge hit. Anthony Williams with a big tackle for loss for the Bulls. Trot on the roll out. Nicholas with the great tackle loses four yards. Watch, pull oh, behind the line of scrimmage. Oh, Ten seconds to go. Irvin trying to break a 10-10 tie. It is blocked. He's six foot five. He was the jumper, and I think he's the one that got it. Nutter to the air. Nearly picked off by the Bulls. Malika Mitchell knocks it away. What a big hit by Jay Mize. All right, here you go. Draw the victory. South Florida now with third and three. South Florida, nine of 18 on third down, but none bigger than this. Ruben on the catch. Ruben on the run. Ruben cuts it back to the 20. Ruben still going. DeAndre Ruben is on the five-yard line. First and goal, straight ahead, and Jones this time is detonated by Mitchell. Oh, my. Check the helmet, make sure the strap is still on. That's why he's on the Buckus Award list. UCF coming on the blitz. Jill Miss throwing as he's tackled, completes it to Andre Hall. Great move. Using a block, he'll score. Oh, oh, oh. And the interception by the Bulls. How about that? Look at this. Demetrius Woods. He says, I want to play some quarterback too. The oh! South Florida. <laughs> and here comes Patterson. Is anybody blocking him? Fisher makes him miss. Uh -oh. And then comes out the other side. The 20. Now throws the ball. Wide open wide receiver. Touchdown. Elgin Hicks. Ladies and gentlemen, you got yourself a football player. Number five is a game breaker. Seconds left. Everybody up. Snap. Hold. Kick. Got plenty of leg. Oh! Good. Oh! The Bulls win at the gun. Bulls up 31 to 7. Here's a pitch. Here comes Jackson. This time he'll throw. Caught. Derek Carter. Touchdown, USF. The Bulls score again on Louisville. Jackson's pass is complete. The number 85, Derek Carter, touchdown, USF.
Love USF sports? Then catch 47. Football. Catch 47. Basketball. Catch 47. Baseball. Catch 47. Soccer. Catch 47. If it's your sport, if it's your game, then it's Catch 47. Tampa Bay Sports Television. Catch 47 and Bright House Networks, the official cable partner of USF Athletics. Only on Bright House Networks.